Solomon, the son of David, Suleiman ibn Dawood, was his father's inheritor as a just king and a divinely guided prophet. By presenting these models of sovereign virtue, the Quran makes us appreciate that in the right hands, wealth and authority can be a great blessing. This is a story about gratitude to the king of kings, the source of all benefit and beauty. In Solomon's hands, technology was used not for destruction, but to build a wondrous civilization. It is a story about knowledge and power and the power of knowledge. It alludes to the miracles that become possible through a deep connection with divine revelation. It is also a story about animal kingdoms and queendoms, reminding us that all creatures form communities like ours, each celebrating the praises of the Lord in its own way. When Solomon, peace be upon him, asked for a kingdom which would never be replicated, he was granted the keys to subduing the creation, even those spirit beings known as the jinn. Through the power of language, he could direct the birds and communicate with other creatures. Modern science is still scratching the surface of animal language and communication, and indeed there still exist language barriers between members of the human race. Little wonder then that Solomon, peace be upon him, was moved time and again to give thanks to the Almighty. He asks for the gift of gratitude and to be granted the means to attain God's pleasure and satisfaction. <laughs>
This surah or chapter of the Qur'an is named after the ants, which invites us to pay special attention to this remarkable interaction. Modern research lets us know that ants are ruled over, as it were, by a queen, an interesting prelude to the story of Sheba, which is to follow. Here was a worker ant, almost certainly female too, as the wording also suggests, who was on the lookout and sounded the warning as King Solomon's troops approached. Rather than fleeing for her own safety, she did everything in her power to ensure that her fellow ants would not be crushed by this overwhelming force. No wonder then that King Solomon smiled when these words of warning were carried to his ear. Not only was he impressed at her perceptiveness and concern, he was also touched to hear the ant imply that his troops would never trample knowingly upon any of God's creation. After passing through the valley, the king's attention turned to the birds, which formed an important division of his army. They possessed the skills of surveillance and hunting, provided shade for the troops, and may even have engaged in combat. It is said that the hoopoe bird was a specialist in detecting water. It may be the case that the one mentioned in these verses was the commander of his division, 
Therefore, the king would have to make abundantly clear that any unauthorized absence would not be tolerated in his army. The bird was about to come speeding back, but what excuse would he provide in order to save his neck? <laughs> Did this little bird bring information unknown to the king? It is always possible for any member of society to contribute something unique and valuable. Still, the context implies that King Solomon, peace be upon him, already had the matter of this Yemeni kingdom of Sheba under consideration. Indeed, that might explain why the hoopoe bird undertook his independent surveillance mission. In any case, here were fresh details, which prompted the king to put his strategy into action. The dominance of sun worship in Sheba was preventing its people 
from bowing before the creator of the sun, whose authority is asserted even over the loftiest of his creations, known as the mighty and majestic throne. In this context, the earthly throne of the Queen of Sheba was a symbol of pretension and arrogance. And so Solomon, peace be upon him, would deal with it specially in the process of bringing her into submission before God. It was part of the divine mandate given to Prophet Solomon that he should take action against disbelieving nations and invite them to monotheism. Indeed, we may assume that the Queen of Sheba was well aware of how he had dealt already with surrounding kingdoms. Now, if the Hupobard had indeed just returned from Sheba, it would be straightforward for him to return there with a special delivery for the Queen. <laughs> As befits the beauty of the message, the letter arrived in a noble form. It spoke with directness, but not before invoking the names of the merciful God. We may wonder what language it was written in. Most likely, King Solomon would have had it written in the Arabic tongue of its recipients. After all, translation from Hebrew would be trivial compared to interpreting the birds and the ants. The miraculous nature of its delivery would not have escaped the queen, who is known in tradition as Bilqis. It seems that her first instinct was indeed to submit, to Solomon at least, if not yet to God, for she recognized that this was no ordinary message and no empty threat. She was moved, like that ant before her, by an overwhelming concern for her people, lest they be crushed by a superior force. Yet it was her practice, as mandated by the Qur'an for the believers, to consult with the experts and representatives of the people. If she found them to be hawkish, then she would need to employ her wisdom to win their support for her strategy. Oh. 
leading her people to surrender, the Queen needed to ensure that Solomon was no worldly king who could be bribed or appeased. If he did accept her lavish gifts, that would be a sign of moral weakness, and it could even be that her troops could repel or overcome his. But no, as a king he was not impressed. As a prophet he was not swerved. As a strategist he sent back a powerful rebuke and ultimatum 
which guaranteed that the Queen would gather a delegation and hasten to his presence. In the meantime, he put another plan into action, using the forces at his disposal to dazzle the Queen with things from beyond this world. The first thing he needed was for her throne to be brought at speed over a distance well over a thousand miles. But who would rise to this challenge? <laughs> The king threw out his challenge. The first bid came from a powerful jinni, who was quickly outbid, but by whom? And with what sort of power? For us today, teleportation remains in the realms of science fiction. So what was this knowledge which allowed its possessor to outpace the winds and the mighty jinn? It couldn't have been magic and sorcery, which were condemned by revelation. Rather, it was a science derived from revelation itself. 
Perhaps when emanating from a pure heart and sincere tongue, certain invocations and supplications could bring about immediate divine assistance. They say that it was a pious man from among King Solomon's ministers at whose hands this miracle was performed, or that it was the angel Gabriel. It may even be that Solomon himself, peace be upon him, is described here as the possessor of knowledge from the scripture, meaning that he outbid the jinn in his own challenge in order to remind them of his mastery over them. Whatever the case may be, this unique throne arrived at King Solomon's court while the queen and her entourage were still making their way. Now he would set about preparing a test for her of her knowledge and perception in order to guide her to submission to the Almighty. A welcoming party accompanied the Queen on her way to the palace of King Solomon, showing her the wonders of his kingdom along the way. Her throne had been altered slightly and placed outside, as though to symbolise the end of the sovereignty she had enjoyed. When asked whether it was that same elaborate throne of hers, she displayed her wit by choosing an ambiguous response, yet it was clear to her that this was a test and that something quite impossible had occurred. Some commentators take the words following her response to have been stated by the believers who had preceded her in knowledge of the one God. If they are a continuation of her own speech, they mean 
I already knew that this man is no ordinary king and I came here in readiness to submit to him. As for the real submission, which is to become Muslim in its true sense, that was still being held back by the overwhelming influence of culture and tradition, as well as her own lofty status in that idolatrous society. None of us is free from the influence of environment and culture, but a brave soul is one who thinks beyond. <laughs> King Solomon's unique workforce of jinns and men had constructed a palace which far exceeded the imagination of the Queen of Sheba. Its entrance courtyard was constructed from sheer glass, like crystal or ice. It may even have had water running beneath it and fish swimming by in plain sight. Unlike many prophets and messengers of lofty rank, Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him, was given an earthly kingdom and material riches. Unlike most kings, he took care of the needs of the people before indulging in luxuries like this palace, and without doubt, his greatest wealth was in his heart. In bringing this noble queen into guidance, he tailored a method inspired by revelation. Her arrogance was finally broken when she was made to look clumsy in front of his courtiers and her followers. As she hastened to meet the king, her eyes were deceived and she mistook the sheer palace floor for a lake. Likewise had she been misled by the sheer brilliance of the sun and failed to look beyond to its transcendent creator. Finally, she confessed that Solomon's bounties could have come from none but the creator of heavens and earth, and so she renounced her former deeds and embraced the worship of the King of Kings. In so doing, she retained her dignity and said, I submit with Solomon, that noble prophet, to show her the way. As for what happened next, this is not the concern of the Quran. Did the Queen return to her homeland and rule in accordance with the true religion? Did a marriage take place? Speculation here is a luxury beyond our means. <laughs> قالت رب إني 
ظلمت نفسي وأسلمت مع سليمان لله 